Welcome to Full Circle Brussels. Tonight, we'll hear from Dr. Roger Neboon on becoming an expert. Great. Well, thank you very much for, um, for this invitation. I, I've called it Becoming Expert. Uh, I'm Roger Neboon. I'm a professor of surgical education and engagement science at Imperial College London, one of the big um, London universities. Um, and uh, I lead a centre there for engagement and simulation science. Uh, and I also lead a centre for performance science between Imperial and the Royal College of Music, uh, which is just next door. And uh, since 2019, I've had this uh, very exciting role as Professor of Anatomy at the Royal Academy of Arts on uh, Piccadilly, Burlington House, for those of you who know that part of London, which I imagine is most of you. Um, this is an interesting role. It was established in 1759, when just ju just a month after the Royal Academy was was founded, and its first uh, professor of anatomy was William Hunter, famous anatomist and obstetrician, who uh, throughout his life worked very closely with artists, uh, and you'll probably fam be familiar with with this very famous picture, the anatomy of the human gravid uterus, and I think this is a very interesting one because it it points out, I think. Um, that sort of intersection between art and practicality and scientific knowledge at, at, the, at the time, um, which I'm going to, to talk about in, in, in the course of the next half hour or so. Um, so, so William Hunter was the, he was the first professor of anatomy. I'm, I'm the 14th and there's been an unbroken line of them ever since. Um, and I'm going to draw on a number of sort of areas I, I've explored over the last few years that have led to the publication of this book, Expert Understanding the Path to Mastery, which was published by Penguin Books in um, August last year. And in this book, um, I look at what it means to become expert, not so much at expertise as a sort of disembodied quality, but at the human story, really, of what it means to become expert. And here I'm just going to pause and make sure that you can both still hear and see me. Is that OK? Louis? Yes, perfect. Fine. Mm -hmm. OK, um, so the, 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 the sort of um, very well known descriptive model uh, of three stages, apprentice, journeyman and master, goes back to the, to the time of the medieval guilds, of course. And I think it's quite a useful um, it's quite a useful model to have in mind because it's so familiar uh, and it has these these three steps of knowing nothing as a as an apprentice becoming sufficiently skilled to go out across the country you're in as a journeyman and apply your craft and then as a master passing your knowledge and skills on to those coming uh, after you of course uh, difficult words these days I, I use them not in any gendered sense of course but simply because they are uh, familiar familiar categories but I think the problem with this um, this account is that it's a descriptive account it, it explains what this uh, it, it, it describes these processes as if you were on the outside looking in but it doesn't really explain what they're like from the inside looking out and so in this book I've um, I've used that model but I've divided these steps there they are along the top of the screen apprentice journeyman and master into into subdivisions um, and those are the things I'm going to talk about just to give you a sense of what I've been looking at. So the apprentice stage is when you're you're spending lots of time doing things that you may not understand or like but you have to do them anyway because someone else tells you to and at the time that can seem pretty boring and uh, un uh, certainly uninteresting and often unproductive but actually looking back on it you usually find that, that that's been a very useful time because it's not only taught you how to do various aspects of what you've committed to learning, but it's also given you uh, a sense of the materials that you're working with, the instruments, the tools, and the space that you're inhabiting with other people. The journeyman stage I'll talk a bit about later on as well, because I think there are two fascinating things, so changes that happen here, which are really about changing your attentional focus from, from thinking that the work is about about you and what you've learnt to, to recognising that it's for somebody else, whoever that works for, but at the same time, and often it, it, it pulling in, an, in the opposite direction, is the recognition that it is about you because it's about developing your individuality, your, your style, your uniqueness. And then finally, the master stage of passing it on, also very interesting. <clears throat> and I think all these things 
are coming into particularly sharp focus over the over the past year or so with everything that's been happening with the pandemic with experts whom to believe how to why to believe them uh, and so on but i thought i'd start off as i start the book by introducing you to one of the many experts in this in this book whose stories i tell more than 20 of them um who i've been working with for for many years some of them now uh and who come from all, all kinds of walks of life and and they've shone a light for me on what it means to become expert and the first of them is derek frampton who's a taxidermist and when i went to see him a couple of years ago three or four maybe um he was he was he was posing this clouded leopard and her cub i never really met a taxidermist before um and i was astonished at the, at the sort of lifelike beauty of this of this creature and her her little her little cub next to her and i asked derek to explain how he works uh and he he explained to me that his his work it, it isn't a science it isn't a craft it isn't an art or at least it is all of those things but it's not any one of them exclusively it takes place at a sort of intersection between those between those things there, there is of course science in it um here he is uh drawing the, the vital statistics if you like of a of a, a lion um because the 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 work that he does uh has to be precise anatomically precise very often he's working with animals who might be on the verge of extinction uh, or for one reason or another are crucially important to have absolutely right for the zoologists ecologists of the future so there is science but there's also of course craftsmanship uh, and here he is in his um in his in his house and his workshop with all these creatures animals birds reptiles fish all kinds of things big ones small ones um and when i asked him what how he does it because i was surrounded there there was this creature in front there was a zebra skin over the back of a chair there were all kinds of things he said well um yeah uh, well, i i I'll, I'll tell you because he's been doing it for 40 45 years he said he says all, all, all you do it's, it's it's pretty straightforward really all you do with an animal like this is first of all you take you take the skin off and then you prepare it uh and then you just um you just sculpt a clouded leopard that size and shape and put the skin back on and i thought that was fascinating because it's that word just that that gave me i think a clue to the kind of the 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 the, the kind of experience that people like derek frampton have because to me sculpting any clouded leopard uh would be completely completely unimaginable let alone sculpting one exactly that size and shape so that you can put the skin back on and make it look like that and so there's something i think very interesting about the the difference between how experts see themselves and describe their work and what you might see looking from the outside um another one for example andrew garlic a harpsichord maker uh is is uh somebody i'll come back to later um but before i do that i i want to just take you really to the to the beginnings of of my first career which was um as a trauma surgeon um i've had several phases to my career the first one was in surgery the next one was as a general practitioner a family doctor and now i'm an academic at a at a big university but the first one was when i was um i was at the beginning of a f- what turned into a five year time in southern africa in the 1980s difficult challenging time to to be there um and i started off uh in soweto on the outskirts of johannesburg which at that time was one of the most violent um violent and difficult parts of of the world um this is an example this is looking out over uh Soweto from the hospital where I was Baragwanath hospital now Chris Harney Baragwanath hospital and it was a kind of medical practice I hadn't really encountered before uh, at all this is the one of the wards and you can see there are patients down both sides of this small side ward but there are also patients on little stretchers underneath each of those beds very crowded um these are a couple of patients in the middle and on the left who the previous night were stabbed in the chest they've both had uh serious injuries to their chest collapsed lungs and you can see that they've got little tubes um draining the air out of their chest and they're carrying bottles each of them which are to uh to drain out blood and 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 air and and they're walking around with their drip bags on their heads not carrying them on drip stands as you might find in this 
country, uh, the intravenous fluids, and they're getting sort of open air physiotherapy under the watchful eye of, 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 of the nurses over there. And at that time, I was beginning to cut my teeth as a surgeon. So here I am on the right of the picture, um, leading a, a, a surgical team in the middle of the night uh, with somebody not much, uh, well, younger than, than me as my first assistant. I'm in my mid-twenties or so. Um, and I show you this because um, I've that now at this point reached somewhere uh, in the early stages, in the shallow end of that trajectory I showed you in my initial picture. And it made me think of what are those stages as an apprentice that you go through before you start to take responsibility for doing things uh, on your own. Uh, and I thought I would um, I'd spend a little bit of time talking about that early stage, which I described as as doing time. I've got it over there on the left of the picture, where you are just conforming to a system that expects you to do things. And it doesn't particularly care whether you like them or not. And I thought I'd just read you a couple of pages from my book where I, I, I explain my own perspective a few years earlier than what I've just shown you, but when I was just beginning as a medical student. It's a Sunday in Manchester Royal Infirmary in 1974, and I've been sent to do the bloods. For the whole morning, I go from patient to patient, taking blood for routine post-operative pre-operative tests. Nobody else wants to do this job, which is why I've been given it. It's the first time I've been in hospital as a medical student and I'm feeling excited. Proudly wearing my new white coat, I've crammed my pockets with specimen tubes, syringes, needles and a wad of request forms. A harassed houseman, as newly qualified doctors were called at that time, showed me once what to do and then vanished, leaving me to face the ward on my own. By now, I'm halfway through my time at medical school. For three years, I've been learning facts. I've spent hours in the dissecting room, memorising anatomy. I've spent hours in the histology lab, too, looking at slides under the microscope. I've learnt about physiology, pharmacology and pathology, but I've never touched a patient. My first two bloods are easy, patients with large, juicy veins, which are straightforward to puncture. My confidence blossoms, but not for long. It turns out I've had beginner's luck. Once reality kicks in, I discover that taking blood can be incredibly difficult. Some patients seem to have no veins at all, or thick hard ones like clay pipe stems, or deceptive ones that look easy but burst into huge bruises at the touch of a needle. Often I cause my patients pain as I try again and again, and although they're very understanding, I feel dreadful. Even managing the kit is a challenge. I need at least four hands to hold the syringes, needles, tourniquets, sticking plasters and swabs. In spite of all the facts I've learnt, when it comes to doing, I'm all thumbs. Just as bad are the triplicate forms and the specimen tubes with tiny shiny labels, which my biro won't write on properly. Yet unless I'm meticulous, the forms and tubes can get muddled up, and that could be disastrous. Quite apart from the physical skills of blood taking, I have to develop ways of keeping track, ensuring I can put my hand on things when I need them. Nobody told me about that part. I've had to create a system for myself. It's tough, but gradually I get the hang of it, and after a few more Sundays I feel a lot more confident. A couple of months later, that new confidence takes another hit. I've been sent to insert a cannula, put up a drip, as it's often called, in a patient who's been admitted on the emergency take. His blood pressure is low, the houseman is busy, and I've been told to set up an intravenous infusion. I've seen it done before, and it looked straightforward enough. After all, I've learnt how to take blood now so I should be able to put in a cannula into a patient's vein. Then reality kicks in again. Faced with a sick patient, a bag of sterile saline and yards of plastic tubing, I have no idea what to do. I'm back to square one. And I, 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 I <clears throat> tell that story because I think it exemplifies a lot of things about this stage where you're, where you're an apprentice, you're doing time, you're you're doing stuff that other people tell you to do. You may not want to do it. You may not like it. It may be very boring, but you have to do it anyway, often for years. But in the process, you learn stuff that you're not even aware that you're learning at the time. So in my case, it was uh, taking blood, which is a 
something doctors of course have to be able to do and all the other procedures that go with it but it was more than that I started to get an understanding of what the work involved and I started to understand more about working with with other people uh, but I hadn't I hadn't seen it that way at the time I just saw it as uh, repetitive tasks and this came into focus for me when I when I came to know Joshua Byrne who's a bespoke tailor who I um, have spent a lot of time um, working with over the last more than 10 years now. Now Joshua Byrne is an interesting man. He, he, he started off studying economics at university but dropped out halfway through his course because he suddenly realised that he didn't want to do that. He wanted to become a tailor. Um, so he moved from being at university to being an apprentice jacket maker, which he did for five years, uh, and then did another apprenticeship in a different kind of tailoring. And, and now he is able to, uh, to put together a whole lot of skills that he, that he developed at that time in a sort of uh, seamless, fluid way. But, but it hasn't always been like that, because when he was beginning, he said he spent months, almost years, learning, in his case, to make pocket flaps. That became his shorthand for boring repetitive tasks of no apparent value at the time. Pocket flaps for jackets, they have to be made very carefully, they're much more difficult than they look. But but he had to keep on making these again and again and again and every so often his master would come along and just look disapprovingly at his work and say no, not good enough, but wouldn't tell him why. Now of course pocket flaps, jackets need pocket flaps, but Joshua said that he, he had a real issue here because at university he was used to thinking it was mostly about ideas and concepts and he'd grasp one of those and quickly move on to the next one. Even though the ideas were quite difficult, sometimes he would grasp them and that would lead to another idea. But with the pocket flaps, it was the other way around. Right from the beginning, he could understand what he needed to do, but it was years before he could do it. And he found that very uncomfortable to begin with because he wasn't used to not being able to grasp something and do it quickly if he really wanted to. And he said he came to a point where he had to, he realised he had a choice. Either he could, he could find this repetitive task inexpressibly tedious, or he could somehow find a way to make that work he had to do interesting. And I thought that was very, that was very illuminating because he found ways of framing that work as a means to becoming better. Anyway, um, we we now move on to that second stage I talked about, that that journeyman stage where you go out into the outside world and you ply your craft or your trade. And here um, I learnt a lot from working with some close-up magicians. Close-up magicians are very interesting, I think. They they, they, of course, like all other experts, they have to spend years and years and years um, practicing making coins and cards and things, do extraordinary things in front of the mirror. But they, they say that there comes a time when you realise that, that all that stuff that you've spent years learning doesn't actually amount to very much unless there is an audience. And unless that audience believes, even for a fraction of a second, that something impossible has just happened because that's the magic otherwise it's just dexterity and so the magician several magicians said to me you have to you have to realize that it's not about you it's about them not about you and the things that you can do and show off but about where it lands with in this case your audience and I realized that made a lot of sense to me because uh, by the time I got to the stage of that operation I showed you in Soweto I'd, I'd done a lot of studying, passed some quite a lot of difficult exams, and I was quite keen to show off what I could do. But actually I had to realise that, that nobody else g g g gave a toss about what I could do really, unless I was able to help them. It was only of any value when it, when it did something for somebody else, and that might be a patient, in my case it might be a customer, in Joshua's case it might be an audience, or a client, or someone who sees your work in an art gallery, or whatever. But it nonetheless is not about you. Um, and so this, um, I think this brings me to, to that tension I talked about when I alluded to this first, that it's, it's, it's not about you as a sort of guiding principle because that's about placing or replacing your attentional focus where it needs to be. But acknowledging also 
is that in another sense it is about you because you're not just an interchangeable cipher as you become more and more uh, as you move further along that path to, 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 to mastery you are developing and growing into your own individuality your style your uniqueness your what the jazz musicians talk to talk about as voice the the characteristics that make you identifiably you so this is one of the magicians I've been working with, Will Houston. The kind of thing, of course, that I mentioned that they practice very early on where you have to be able to have these, um, these very highly developed skills. But I thought I'd just show you a brief glimpse of, of Will putting all this together. Um, we're at the Art Workers Guild here in London, extraordinary organisation. And it's a, an event I convened to bring surgeons and magicians together to explore one another's worlds. And Will here is just giving a very brief example of a piece of magic that he does uh, to, to a number of other expert magicians. And I'd like you to watch not only what he does with his hands, but what how he engages with his audience. Now, I'm not going to touch them. Instead, I'll keep my hands just slightly over the top all the way through. Now, hopefully, if I give a little wave, one of the coins will jump, followed by the second, and then the third. <laughs> Another wave, one goes back, second goes back, and the third goes back, and then covering them all for just a second, they all make their way together. <laughs> so this is Will engaging his audience's attention to give them an experience that goes far beyond the extraordinary things that he does with his hands. And you can see from the response of the other distinguished magicians that they're pretty impressed with that, as indeed anyone would be. Um, but it's all about, I think it's all about creating an experience for whoever's watching. And in the last few minutes, I want to point out something that I think also happens at this stage when people are, are well along the path to to mastery. And that's the idea of improvising. Now, I think improvising often has a bad name. It, it sort of brings to mind people who haven't really taken the trouble to learn to do something properly. And they just sort of knock something up on the spur of the moment and couldn't be bothered to prepare and just sort of uh, had a go. But I don't think it's that at all. I think true improvising is an extremely high uh, level of expert practice. Um, and it's something that true experts are able to do almost without realising it. They are able, I think, to draw on those many years and often decades of practice and those stages I've talked about of, uh, of spending time with your stuff, of, of learning, in the case of musicians, say, of learning scales and arpeggios, how to play their instrument, of, 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 of learning repertoire, of listening to other musicians, all that kind of thing, so that they can respond in the moment to a situation they have not encountered, but do so intelligently and, um, and suitably, but able to reach out and, and make use of what they've already internalised. And so I'm going to show you just at the end a couple of uh, a very brief clip of something that I think really exemplifies that. It's a musical example, but it's not from jazz, which is what people often think of with um, improvisation. It's, it's, uh, it's a, a, a pianist called David Dolan, who's a professor of classical improvisation at Guildhall School of Music in London, and his colleague um, Thomas Carroll, who's a cellist. And they're playing uh, three fantasy pieces by Schumann, but we're not going to hear the fantasy pieces by Schumann. We're going to hear just the beginning where they play an improvised introduction. They actually improvise in between the pieces and again at the end, but this is just the, the initial I introduction. And, and we're going to see them uh, play something in the spirit of Schumann, but which he didn't write. In fact, which nobody wrote because it's never been written. Not something they rehearsed or practiced, but something which they are putting together in the moment as it happens in response to one another. Um, never been played before and you'll you'll see the moment when they when they change because David's sitting at the piano there uh, during this this very short prelude um, is looking at the keyboard and then there's a gap we see him look up at the at the music to to then move into what Schumann wrote and that's where we have to leave them but let's join them uh, as we as we hear them play this prelude
unfortunately that's where you have to leave it. But I think I think we're seeing a number of examples here of uh, a number of elements that I've been talking about. I think here are two musicians who have obviously gone through this extraordinarily demanding training for years and years and years. And they now got to the stage where they can move their attention or focus, not only from what they're playing on their instruments, but, but listening and responding to one another, and of course being aware of how their music is landing, because this is a public concert. And so they are able to, um, to, to uh, adjust and, and place that attentional focus in creating something that has never been done before. And I think you could certainly not accuse that of being knocked up on the spur of the moment without adequate, um, with adequate experience to do it. So the last stage then in this path is the, is the, path of, is the stage of becoming uh, a, a master in the old style terminology. And I think this is also interesting. It's, I think it's another example of it's not about you, it's about them really. Only this time the them is people coming on after you in your own in your own field rather than your patients, your customers, your audience. Um, and I think that true masters are able not, not, only, not only to share knowledge and skill, but also wisdom. And to me, that's one of the crucial things about being expert is having that wisdom that in, in this case allows people not only to, to, help, to help other people with what they're maybe struggling with, with their their, their, their hands or their techniques or whatever, but also to have that bigger picture of, of whether those people are on the right path at all or whether there, are, whether there are bigger issues. I think it ties into issues like coaching and mentoring and, and having a sense of responsibility for somebody else who has chosen to go along uh, the path that you are also on. Um, and I think that that question of, of what is an expert and why why we need experts is crucially important and um, I hope we can discuss that more when we when we talk in a moment but it seems to me that we need experts for several reasons one one is of course we need experts to do things that that we need to have done or want to have done but we can't do we need experts to play on concert platforms to fly us around when that becomes possible again in airplanes to operate on us when we're sick or to uh, or to fix our boilers or our cars when when those go wrong as well um, but we also need experts because, well, we, 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 becoming expert is important to all of us because I think we are all, each of us, on a path towards becoming expert. We may not be very far along it, we may be a long way along it, but we are all somewhere along that path in each of the aspects of our lives that we, are, that we care about and that we are putting energy into, uh, into developing, whether it's a profession or a hobby or a sport or a language or whatever it might happen to be, I think we are all somewhere on that path. Um, I think one of the one of the one of the things that I feels very strongly about is that the whole the whole debate about about becoming expert I think is uh, is very often poisoned by unhelpful hierarchical distinctions based on the perceived value of a field of expertise rather that rather than on on what being expert consists of and so so. Uh, Brain surgeons and um, airline pilots and concert pianists are often seen as being somehow of greater value than heating engineers or garage mechanics or people who fix your bicycle um, or people who make ceramics. And I think that's a very dangerous um, trap to fall into because I think that these people are, are, are differently expert but no more nor less expert. I think the, 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 the judgment we need to make about whether people are expert to me is whether they have gone along a path that has allowed them to go through these processes that, um, that I've described. And I mean having spent a long time going along that path doesn't necessarily mean that you're expert but I think it is impossible to have become expert without having gone along that path, if that makes sense. Um, and so I'm going to finish by, by, by talking about that path because I think it's, it's easier to see where it starts than where it finishes. I mean, it isn't as easy as you might think to, 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 to define where it does start actually, but a lot of people have talked to me about, you know, how, how do you know when you've become expert? How do you know when you, when you get there, if you're talking about a path? And I'm going, to, I'm going to leave the last word with Joshua Byrne, the tailor, although many of the other people I've spoken to, in fact, pretty much all of them, said something pretty similar. And Joshua, when I asked him, um, 
when he you know when he will reach or when he reached the end of that path he said well you never reach the end of that path um it's a it's a path that has a beginning but it doesn't have an end because because i i know that there is no such thing as a perfect suit but i will never stop trying to make one uh, and to me that that sort of open-endedness that that understanding that you may have come quite a long way but you've still got much further to go is a characteristic of people i would describe as expert thank you <laughs>